These are the notes for AP Calculus on the first fundamental theorem of calculus revisited, which we <coughs> refer to as initial plus change problems. So before we look at our formula for the initial plus change, let's just refresh your memory on why this works here. So <coughs> this applies whenever we have a definite integral, in this case from A to B, of a derivative. And this is a rate here. Well, when it's a derivative, <coughs> this definite integral has a special meaning besides just area. Because when you integrate <coughs> f prime of x, you get f of x. And then you'd evaluate it from a to b. It's the official notation. Remember, I just turn it into brackets to make it a little more user friendly. And then you would substitute an upper limit. and then subtract, substitute in the lower limit. So notice, <coughs> even from this form right here, f of b is the original function, where this f prime is the derivative. That's where it ends up, minus f of a is where it started. So that's one way of seeing why this definite integral represents the change in the original function. on the interval from A to B. Because <clears throat> if you take where you end up, where the function ends up, minus where it started, that's how much it changed by. So in our the way we usually utilize it, though, is usually you start with some initial value, which is f of A. You know where the function starts at. You notice, notice you get that by just <coughs> adding f of a to the other side here, and that's how you solve for f of b. And then the definite integral, as we just saw, represents the change. And the original function f on the interval from a to b. So the way you can recognize these type of problems, because they come in all different types of contexts, is when you have one point on a function, if you're looking for another one, and you also have the derivative of that function. So that's what we have right here. Notice we have the derivative f prime of x. We have one point on the function, the f of 2 is 7. <coughs> and we're looking for another one, f of 5. So where are you looking for it at? That's your b where you're, the initial you're given is a, is in this case 2, <coughs> and then our derivative f prime of x is given right here. So the way you would set this up, oops, if you're looking for f of 5, it's going to equal the initial, I'll first just write it as f of 2 so you can see how to set it up a little more easily, and then plus the change is the integral from a to b, in this case from 2 to 5. So wherever your initial is at, that becomes your lower limit. And wherever you're looking for it at becomes the upper limit. And then the derivative, f prime of x is what goes in here. Alright, so f of 2, now we can put it in as 7. Plus the integral from 2 to 5. And then we can put in our specific equation for the derivative, which is 4x cubed minus 3. So 7 is our initial. That's where the function starts at, at 2. And then plus, when you integrate this, you get 4. Integrate x cubed, you get x to the 4th over 4. Minus when you integrate 3, you get 3x. Evaluate from 2 to 5. Again, I turn those into brackets so it's a little easier to use. And notice the 4s reduce out here. So all we're left with is x to the 4th minus 3x. So we've got our initial is 7. Plus, then when you put in <coughs> 5, we'll have 5 to the 4th 
minus 3 times 5, and then minus plug in 2, 2 to the 4th, minus 3 times 2. So if we just keep simplifying that, we've got 7 as our initial, plus 5 to the 4th. Well, 5 squared is 25. 5 cubed is 125. Times 1 over 5 gives you 625. Minus 3 times 5 is 15. Minus 2 to the 4th is 16. 3 times 2 is 6. Let's move it up here so you can see it better. So 7 plus 625 minus 15 is 610. Minus 16 minus 6 is 10. So 610 minus 10 is 600. So 7 was our initial value, and the depth integral is equal to 600. So in this case, if it's a positive 600, it increases by 600. So f of 5 would equal 607. All right, so that's how you can set it up with an equation. Now let's take a look at what if instead of the equation of the first derivative, you're given the graph of the first derivative. So it says the graph of f prime is shown in the figure above, and they give you f of 1. There's one point on the original function that we know. So that's our initial. So here, 1 is like our a value, and when we're trying to find f of 5, that's like our b. So let's set it up and then see if we can figure it out with the graph of the derivative instead of the equation. So the, the initial f of 2, sorry, f of 1 is our initial plus the change comes from the integral from a to b, here's your a, in this case from 1 to 5, of the derivative, which in this case we have the graph of instead of the equation of. So f of 1, we're told, is 5. And then you just have to remember what this derivative represents graphically. Remember, this is the area between the graph and the x-axis on the interval from 1 to 5. So let's look at that section of our graph here. Here's 1. Yes. And 5. So it's this area we want out here. here. So notice we've got this rectangle here, and then we've got a semicircle here, but we want the area between the curve and the x-axis. So notice if we just take the area of the rectangle minus the area of the semicircle, that'll give us the area we want. So the rectangle, you notice know, is from 1 to 5, its width is 4, the height is 3, so it's 4 times 3, minus the semicircle, it's half a circle, so 1 half pi radius squared. The radius, you can see the center would be here, but the radius is 2 each direction, so it would be 2 squared. So that gives you 12, 4 times 3 is 12, minus 2 squared is 4 times pi, 4 pi times a half, so that's 2 pi. So that area is 12 minus 2 pi, so that's what this depth integral is. And then if we add our initial, which was 5, you get 17. minus 2 pi. So that's what f of 5 equals. Okay, let's look at one more or something a little bit different. Happens. Same graph, but now we're trying to find f of 0. So that's our initial. So notice when you set up the depth integral this time, it's going to look a little weird. Whoops. That should be f of 1, sorry. We're looking for f of 0, so this is f of 1. Because remember our a value, here's your b, this time is 0, when you set it up, always has to start out as the lower of 1. 
and the upper limit is what we're looking for, b is 0. And then it's always the derivative. Integral of the derivative that gives us the change. So f of 1 is still 5. That part's the same as the previous one we did. But notice, because of where our initial was, um, it was actually a larger x value than where we're looking for it. These are reversed. So remember, all you have to do to, when they're in the wrong order to flip them is just, it just makes it the opposite sign. So it's going to be minus instead of plus there. And then that flips it from 0 to 1 instead. So now we just have to end up subtracting instead of adding it. So it'd be 5 minus, again, this represents the area this time from 0 to 1. So just this little triangle right here. The triangle will be 1 half, the base is 1, and the height is 3. So that gives you 3 halves. Well, 5 is the same as 10 halves. Minus 3 halves gives you 7 halves. So that's what f of 0 is. All right. Take a look at an applied one now. This one actually is a two-part problem. At first it says the rate of change. Remember whatever says rate or rate of change, that's just the calculus word for the derivative. Or just another way of saying derivative really. So the derivative of the altitude, or rate of change of the altitude of a hot air balloon in meters per second, that's another clue it's a derivative. Whenever the units are something per something, that's a derivative, is given by R of t. So even though they don't write the prime here, this still represents the derivative or rate of change of the altitude on the interval of 0 to 7. And it says determine the change in altitude during the time the altitude is decreasing. Okay, so it's like those initial plus change ones we've been doing, except it's just the change. So it'd be the integral, but we don't know that interval yet, when the altitude is decreasing, but it's going to be the integral of R of t, because that is our derivative, that's the rate of change of the altitude. So that's how we're going to set it up with no initial, just figuring out the change. However, we don't know the lower and upper limits because we don't know when the altitude is decreasing yet. So that's why I say this is a two-part problem. So this is already the derivative. So when you want to find where something's increasing or decreasing, you first set the derivative equal to zero. In this case, we've got t squared minus 4t plus 3 equals zero. And then in this case, you can factor that. Factors of 3, that would be negative 4 would be negative 1 and negative 3. So we get t equals 1 and t equals 3. When you set those equal to 0, one of them has to be 0. And notice those are both in this interval 0 to 7. So then you would draw your number line. Zero to seven. And then we'll test into R of T. We already know one and three make the derivative of zero. And then if you test zero, since it's not a critical number here, zero would make this one zero minus one is a negative. Zero minus three negative negative times a negative is positive. And you could test these or you could use the shortcut. If you use the shortcut, um, Notice that 1, this has an odd exponent of 1, so it's going to change sign there. 3 comes from this factor, also has an odd exponent, so it's going to change sign there. So this is the derivative altitude, so this shows you the altitude is increasing, then decreasing, and then increasing. But notice the question only asked for the change during the time the altitude is decreasing. 
So it's only decreasing on this interval. So that's where our lower and upper limits are going to come from. From 1 to 3. So now we can actually integrate this from 1 to 3. And r of t we can put in the equation. t squared minus 4t plus 3. So you integrate that, you get t cubed over 3 minus 4t squared over 2 plus 3t from 1 to 3. Let's see, it simplifies just a little bit. 4 divided by 2 is 2, so that's 2t two squared. Alright, <clears throat> so if we substitute in 3 first, 3 cubed is 27 divided by 3 is 9 minus 3 squared is 9 times negative 2 is eight, negative 18 plus 3 times 3 is 9. And then minus 1 cubed over 3, so that's 1 third. 1 squared is 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. 1 times 3 is 3. Notice here that 9 plus 9 is 18 minus 18, so those, that's not always going to happen. They just happen to cancel out here. And then we've got minus um, negative 2 plus 3 is 1. So that's negative, that's 1 third plus 1 is the same as 3 thirds. Gives you 4 thirds, so it would be negative 4 thirds. And see if that makes sense that it's negative. Well, we want to know the change in altitude during the time the altitude is decreasing. So we should get a change that's negative because the altitude is decreasing there. And then the units, notice R of t was meters per second. So when you integrate, it gets rid of the seconds, so it just be meters, which would also make sense for the change in altitude. Negative 4 thirds meters. All right, let's take a look at another applied one in a different context here. This one's a little bit different in that it actually gives you a little overhead view of the city. And it says, located beside a river has a rectangular boundary as shown in the figure below. The population density of the city at any point along a strip X miles from the river's edge. So what this is showing, it's easier to see if we draw a little... Um, rectangle, kind of like an infinitely thin rectangle with the x there. So let's see why this works. So x represents it's x miles from the river's edge. Here's the river's edge right here. So this would be x. So what it's saying is um, everywhere along this infinitely thin rectangle the population density is the same. Versus if the rectangle is over here, if x is different, then it would be a different density here. Maybe more people like to live closer to the river, so the density is higher there. Or maybe um, maybe there's more businesses near the river, so the density, population density is lower and the more housing over here. We don't know. It could be all kinds of different things that cause the density to be different. And notice that density h of x is you don't given the equation, but you're given the units. Persons per square mile. So sometimes they'll refer to it as persons instead of people. It's really the same thing. So let's write that down first. h of x persons per mile squared square mile. And it says write but do not evaluate. So we just have to set this one up. An integral expression that gives a population of the city. So the easiest way to do this one I think is looking at the units. So the units of population would just be people or persons. So we need to get rid of these miles squared. So the first thing you notice, notice everywhere along these eight miles, the density is exactly the same. So if you want, if you think about the units, you can take eight miles, since that's the length of the city this way, and then times h of x, which is in persons per mile squared. And you can see if you multiply those together, one of the miles cancels out. So then you'd have h, sorry, 8 h of x. And now the units are getting a little closer. Now the units for this would just be persons per mile instead of per mile squared. And then 
you can't do the same thing with just multiplying by 3 this way. And that's because the density changes along this distance, depending on what x is. So here's where, notice right here, right at the river's edge, x is 0, and right over here, x is 3. So that's where you have to integrate to get it back to persons. So then if you integrate from 0 to 3, now because the 8 is a constant, you could leave it in here or you could pull on the outside. And then times dx. And now when you integrate, that's going to get rid of the um, per mile, so that would just be back to persons, which is what we want, the population of the city. All right, and finally, let's look at one with the graphing calculator. So it says a pizza heated to a temperature of 400 degrees Fahrenheit is taken out of an oven and placed in a 75 degree room at time zero minutes. So at zero minutes, it's 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like our initial. And then it's, it says the temperature of the pizza is changing at the rate of negative 98.2 E to the negative 0.873 T degrees Fahrenheit per minute. So there's another clue. It's a derivative. And the fact that it tells you it's a rate. To the nearest degree, so we're going to round to the nearest degree, what is the temperature of the pizza at time 4? So they don't have a function to call this here. I'm just going to use capital P for pizza. So what we want is P of 4. And what we're given is the temperature of the pizza at time 0 plus the change would be the integral from 0 to 4 of the derivative, which in this case is negative 98.2 e to the negative 0 0.873 t. And you could integrate this by hand using u substitution, but with all the decimals, it does make it a little easier to use your calculator. So the initial is 400. And then we can just uh, put this in our calculator. So on 84, you just go 400 plus math. function integrate. The newer one's going to look a little fancier. This is going to look more like what we put on paper here. But on this one, you'd have to put negative 98.2 e to the negative 0.873. Remember, we're just going to use x instead of t. That's what we're integrating. And then comma, our variable is x, comma, lower limit 0, comma, upper limit 4. And we get 290.938. But notice that rounds to the nearest degree would be, normally you'd write that down to the thousands place. But it says to the nearest degree, so that round up to 291. And then units here, this was degrees Fahrenheit per minute. When you integrate, it gets rid of that per minute, so it'd just be degrees Fahrenheit. And that concludes the notes for AP Calculus on the topic of the first fundamental theorem of calculus, initial plus change.